Hello and welcome to the Guitar Hang Podcast. I'm your host, John Stancorp. Today we're in for a real treat as we sit down with a true guitar legend, Steve Hackett. You know him from his groundbreaking days with Genesis, his solo work, and his latest Genesis Revisited project. Steve's music has left an indelible mark on the world. From those unforgettable moments in Firth of Fifth to his solo career's innovative twists, Steve's been pushing the guitar limits for decades with his debut on Nursery Crime to his latest release, Circus and the Night Whale. Steve and I chat about his incredible journey, his musical evolution, and the passion that keeps his music moving forward. Please make sure you hit the subscribe button below and ring the bell for notifications. Now let's hang with Steve Hackett. Your, your new year is starting off beautifully. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah, it's it's going it's going fine. I just I've got a lot of a lot of things that are sort of anomalies, like playing in in Norway with Jarvi, Hungarian guys, um, nice. and then I've got an acoustic gig at the weekend. So uh, they're all different sets. You know what I mean? So I'm I'm forever. The most difficult part of my job is getting different sets into my brain. So the fingers go there naturally. I'm not worried about the playing. It's it's um, it's always a case of memory. is the, is the big test. The older you get, and um, the busier you get. In my case, I seem to be busier than ever, and um, and challenged in the old memory uh, department. But there we go. Yeah. Well, the uh, the material that, that you're covering is dense, but it's also vast. If you're doing yeah, it's 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 a lot of different things. You know. I, that's the thing about getting involved with lots of different kinds of music. I, I just decided years ago that um, there was no point worrying about the fact that you know acoustic music was one kind of thing that required a certain amount of dedication. And then um, uh, electric music, you can't afford to be dilettante with either. And I find usually people excel at one or the other, but I thought that if I could be the broadest possible in my approach, um, that that perhaps would inform each each of the two sides of, of guitar playing, that you could use certain techniques perhaps um, that should be off limits, that acoustic guitars shouldn't be treated like electric ones and, and vice versa. Um, but I've found that um, things do work, but you have to, um, think radically it seems to me and um not fall into patterns that um are you know the, the mainstay of the, the classical player or the mainstay of of the rock player um uh, if you love both that's what that's what you'll do it'll be a lifelong exploration yeah yeah, yeah the compositional part of your the guitar player in you is always thinking the bigger picture intertwining all yes. this counterpoint mm. harmony melody and that sort of thing and um your love yes for really informs your electric playing that is not a, yeah. a lot of folks that are steeped in maybe a blues-based idiom or something yeah uh, yeah yeah i think nothing wrong with being steeped in a, in a, in a blues-based idiom um i think that's where all the most interesting uh, sonic developments happened within the electric guitar world. That's where they first learned to really become, I think, expressive as, as, as something to rival the human voice. Um, but I think, you know, acoustic stuff is perhaps, I know you could say it's more subtle, but it's no less powerful in its effect upon the listener. Um, it's a seductive thing. I, I think in general that in order to get the acoustic guitar to have the effect on people that the electric guitar does, I think um, because you're conjuring with more voices, more parts, you've got to, um, I, th I think that the conditions have always got to be, got to be right. You know, um, uh, I mean, I did my nails today, <laughs> but I haven't had a moment to pick up the the acoustic guitar, which is, really what great nails are all about so um for me instead of which i'm plugging in various devices in series to get a um a screaming electric sound 
and um, I can't be in two places at once, it seems. There's only <laughs> one, one of me going around. Looks like you've got some splendid um, guitars there on on the wall there. That looks very, looks very interesting, all those. Oh, thank you. Uh, delightful looking things. Yeah, it's a, it's a collection of, you know, things over the years that kind of have their yes. purpose. Uh, yeah. I would uh, look forward to at some point getting a, uh, I, I love the concept of having a Les Paul with a, a Floyd Rose and the, I've got an Ibanez guitar, a Joe Satriani that has a, a sustainer pickup in the neck. And I love that, but yes. I love it in a Les Paul format. Yeah, I've got the, the, some of the, the Bernie models that Fernandez made um, have have that, you know, so you have the Les, the Les Paul shape. Um, uh, tonally, it compromises the guitar, as you probably probably realize, but then you get something else once you start to work with it. Um, and I've got a, I've got several of them that have Floyd Rose um, uh, attached. And um, I, I know a lot of people say, well, you know, that would be sacrilege to do that, especially with a, you know, a vintage Les Paul, you wouldn't, but but um, the Bernie model, which is Les Paul shaped, um, um, it certainly seems to survive having having a, 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 a trem arm on it. But they're surprisingly hard to get hold of, and they've become very expensive. And I don't quite understand why they haven't taken off worldwide. Because I know so many top players, mm -hmm. that's their go-to instrument because they love the sustain factor and the onboard controlled feedback. Etc. So um, it's interesting that you say there's a, you have an Ibanez that has has that. So you must have lots of upper harmonic with that. I I suspect. Yeah, you had toggles. Very interesting. You had the yeah. mini toggle switch where you can select certain. Right. Things. Yeah, which is nice. Yeah. I, I tour with a Pink Floyd tribute group uh, called the, the American Pink Floyd. So we right. I tend to favor strats and the lap steel and. I do some nylon yes. string stuff on a couple of songs, but uh, right, yeah. At the, uh, that... it would be nice to have one of my strats fitted with. They they make a pedal. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Digitech makes us like a a feedback pedal. It's not exactly right. the same concept. I mean, it sonic right. is a bit different. Right. Yes. Yeah. You know, I haven't heard. I haven't heard of that one. I haven't tried it. Um, there are so many things out there um uh you know it, it all looks mouth-wateringly interesting <laughs> okay. i mean the guitars that, that you have in your wall there you know i see those and, I, and there's the kid in me that goes oh i wonder what that one sounds like you know <laughs> right. i've got a fair idea what 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 those two might sound like but yeah. everything else you know maybe a maybe a surprise and um it's what you're driving it into how you're how you're playing it, of course, it's not necessarily. Uh, it's not just the. Uh, it's not just the machine. It's the, um, the guy who's wrestling with it. I think. Uh, yeah. So much of the time. It is a bit of a challenge uh, to try to recreate fifty years of somebody's style very accurately because technology changed so much, and in the beginning. Yes early days in the early 70s when when you or David Gilmore were uh, playing uh, big yes. places the yes technology was limited but what you were doing yes. was in some ways it was more helpful because even though there are fewer choices you were yes. bigger choices compositionally and sonically within the scope of what you were doing with the band yeah um yeah it's interested to I mean, back in those the stuff that i'm most well known for in fact i think i'm probably hugely embarrassed about the fact that i was only using a couple of fuzz boxes for sustain in those days and so um what is hailed as gospel now um seems to have become you know frozen or, or cast in stone whereas of course i can demonstrate today how much better those parts would have been had I played it with, um, you know, modern stuff. However, in my defense, I would say there was a sound that I used at one point, uh, which featured a color sound pedal and a Rose Morris duo fuzz. And I used to use them 
in series together and it created a very high upper harmonic driven sound but i couldn't usually play it very loudly it would go into feedback but it would give um a hell of a lot of sustain and i think fooled people into thinking that i had endless sustain i, I didn't back in the day um i had enough but I, I always wanted more and of course when the fernandez guitars came along um it was the thing that i'd been talking about for 20 years right. please give me an onboard ebo without having to pick it up you know um <laughs> yeah. so all these guitars of course have got wonderful features the strat has got a wonderful feature to it um the um I've been using Fernandez, I've been using um, Yairi nylons, I've been using um, other things, certainly a Les Paul from time to time. Um, uh, also one of Brian May's design guitars. Um, that has a very interesting um, upper harmonic feature. The fact that you can put all of the pickups yeah. out of phase with each other. That's that's a, a, a very interesting i was just playing it a minute ago and thinking yep i could i could use this i've never gotten around to using it live um i tend to sort of go for my um uh, my 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 fernandez because it's like john paul jones funny enough i was working with him many years ago in in japan and he was saying saying i understand why you would feel the need to use that he said um because if you don't you know some of the language is missing once you get used to having a tremolo arm once you get used to having sustainer stuff um you uh you say oh where is it the, the ultimate guitar will have the best of all of these things you know a fat screaming wonderful thing that sustains like crazy and um uh, but it, it seems to me that no guitar actually has it all. Um, I haven't been able to give my allegiance totally to one guitar and say, yep, this is it. <laughs> right. This right. is it. This is, this is my this is my Excalibur, as it were. No, yeah. I wouldn't. I wouldn't I'd say that I I, uh, I moonlight from one to the other. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, there'll be moments when I'll be thinking the Les Paul isn't giving me enough top and then I'll boost it in a certain way. And then you think, why did I think that? You know, it's just how it's set. There isn't an overall setting with your amps and your and your pedals, really, that uh, you just have to keep fiddling. So you never really quite get it pinned down. You do for a live gig, of course. Oh, right. Doing an album is a whole different, as I'm sure you know, it's, I'm sure I'm not telling you anything you don't, already know yeah one thing I, I always admired about your your playing is you would move effortlessly between tremolo bar vibrato wrist yep. vibrato, and then a classical style vibrato each yep. that had a certain nuance to it and it was so vocal and so expressive uh, i just i really that that's one of my your one of my biggest influences in that department of moving between the bar wrist vibrato and um i would probably say that i practiced it took me decades honestly with vibrato because i didn't have great vibrato back in my early genesis days i i just didn't i wanted to have great finger vibrato um it wasn't really till i moved to very light strings um and practiced vibrato probably more than any any other thing and eventually it came and i and i realized that the way to teach it to somebody was to say wide and slow make sure you do encompass the the range of the note over over um not just a semitone but if you can do a, a tone as well um but you know there'll be certain times i'll go for it and i think oh great vibrato list lovely it's also dependent on tone of course what kind of vibrato you're going to use there's one more other thing that i've discovered recently because when it comes down to tapping most people just use the
the, the pad of the finger or fingers. I've discovered three different tones that you can use with this, where it's the pad, it's the nail, the flat of the nail, and I have a ring um, which I use on this finger. I can also tap with the ring. And oh. you can incorporate, if you're very clever, you can incorporate ring slides um, in the same way that you might if you had a had a had a slider or or, or a bottleneck. So there are there are techniques, and I know there's much more in this, but you're you're driving the guitar in, in a different way. It's it's saying goodbye to all those guitar lessons that you've been giving yourself over the years and going, well, I don't have to do this. If I was an alien and I just landed and I thought, well, yeah, maybe it, maybe it does this. Maybe I'm supposed to play it with my teeth. Maybe I'm supposed to do it, drive it with, with, a, with, a, with a ring. Um, the, the ring will give you lots of different um, possibilities of just tickling the strings or creating apparent feedback things and and indeed making it sound like you're doing runs if you get the tone tone right but it's actually just just a ring going up and down the um not even the fretboard but um you know going adjacent strings right um uh as i say i you know so many different ways to drive a string i think um and we we just stuck with 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 their own prejudice when it comes to it really when yeah. we start out but there'll be other ways of doing it so many different things yeah. we're all just scraping the surface of it all the time all of us i think right even a you know a lifetime is far too short with um exploring the, the parameters of of guitar it, it seems like the more we surround ourselves with players uh, that inspire us, where yeah. we're working on compositions, it always yeah. drives an interesting technique that serves the song in a way that yes. maybe some of these discoveries came about as you were, you had this perfect part where everything else was set up for, and you're figuring out what am I gonna what am I gonna do to serve this particular song uh, yeah so it kind of leads me into a, a question about the the new album the circus and night whale um yeah the collaboration the partnership that you have with roger king is yes uh, is is a wonderful thing i would sus uh, suspect because the two of you seem to uh create some great stuff together obviously the chemistry that you have on stage i'd just be interested to hear about the how that partnership between you and Roger came about? Um, when I first started working with Roger, um, he didn't really come up with any um, opinions for months. I think he was very much um, after doing whatever the client wanted and that was me as the client and it wasn't until I started asking what, what he thought that I realized there was this whole wealth of, of um, opinions and, and possibilities that he had and um, and I realized he, he he was pretty radical but but um, um, versatile and, and, and flexible um, it's it's very interesting yeah i think it is a unique partnership um it's one that's um it's developed over the years and i think the current album i would say is the best produced of all the albums we've done so far now i i, I think that there is a tendency to want to fly the flag to <laughs> owe your allegiance to the current to one's own current project but um, time and time again, I find myself listening to this and thinking, no, I think I did make the right choices. I, I could have gone for, I could have gone for bigger guitar sounds, but I got something that sat at the front of the speakers and um, something can always be different. You'll always be going, oh, well, yes, you could have had that, but then you could have had this, et cetera, et cetera. Um, he's a very good all-rounder, very good 
definitely a very good, um, very good engineer. Um, he does a wonderful impersonation of a drummer, should you wish it. <laughs> um, and big, you know, ambient, devilish sounding stuff, you know, it sounds like a, like a giant stomping through if you want that stompy kind of sound. Um, he happens to be uh, a brilliant of that. We actually recorded um, many of the drum performances uh, live when we were on tour. So uh, we set aside some time where possible at sound checks to, um, to have Craig um, listen to the music we'd done so far and put drums on after, after the event. Right. Um, so it meant we got hall ambiences as well as whatever you can do in the box. So um, that was a new approach for me. I'd often wondered, you know, live listening to drums sometimes at sound checks where they sound absolutely monstrous and wondering whether is it sheer volume that's seducing me with this or is it um, is it tone and is this you know a way of getting extra weight into the drums um, what is it about live that you wish you could capture in the studio and and you're you're chasing one one medium when you're in the thick of it in another right. um, uh, but uh, Roger has been very good at that as has uh, Ben Fenner um, been some wonderful drum sounds from him and of course to get a performance from a great player from a great drummer um, and I figure I've got at least three great drummers on this album um, uh, so I'm 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 very lucky, you know, being very spoiled for choice to have um, Craig Blundell, Nick De Vigilio, kick, yeah. Nick, it's Nick who kicks off the album, yeah. um, and Hugo Dagenhart, who I've started working with again as well, um, who also happens to be uh, uh, brilliant. So they're all they're all drum masters in a way. Um, uh, I, I think in, 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 in recent years or even recent decades, I've had the opportunity to work with um, some fabulous rhythm sections. Right. And um, it's, 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 it's very hard to go back when you've seen the kind of godlike creations that, that um, some of your collaborators have, have come up with. You know, I mean, um, over the years, I got I got to work with um, some of the gods. Um, I never came across a more expressive and resonant singer than, than Richie Havens in yeah. the 1970s. And as Genesis members, we were all fans of what what he could do. Usually, just with one voice and one acoustic guitar. Um, so, you know, that wasn't lost on me. And um, I, I learned a little bit about singing from him, even though I, I sound completely different. But um, uh, again, I think that he had this thing about, you mentioned about serving the song. And um, I know it's something that Phil Collins said at one point about serving the song. And I think he's absolutely right that um, you've got to be right for the song. You, if a song requires a certain degree of delicacy, there's no point being a, a bull in a china shop about it. I don't, I don't really want contrary performances from people. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'll, I'll listen when they say, oh, I think we can do this, we can do this. But I think in my time with drummers, there's been a radical aspect. I, I did an album in Brazil um, Around about circa 1982, 83, and um, uh, the drummers that I was using very often were guys that owned one drum, and so we were using this kind of binary approach: um, one man, one drum. Who works in a team where 
a rhythm is established and um, there, there might be moments, breaks when almost like a referee's whistle comes up and, and um, then the Samba school does something else. Um, so that was for me, my total immersion in percussion. And I learned that um, drums could be played in a very different way and just as powerfully um, to rival the approach that, that, that rock drummers had. So then you've got all of that apparently tribal approach. You've also got uh, the orchestral approach, uh, which is different again. And you've got a, a rock drummer's approach. Um, not to mention a percussionist's approach where drums will be merely part of right. their, um, their, their arsenal. Yeah, the, uh, I always like the weather report era stuff where you had a mix of, it's, a, it's fusion of all uh, world music, jazz, everything. Yes. The way the yes. interplay between percussion and drums and yes. hips and that sort of thing. It's very powerful. Yeah, weather report, very, very interesting. And um, um, I was thinking of none of Vasconcello's work also, um, you know, uh, that was that was very interesting with, with Pat Matheny. Um, uh, a different approach again, where um, I think the approach was that he was a creature in the jungle that was making sounds. Uh, funnily enough, I, I, I did a, a track with we had some pretty heavy drums going and then th this guy came in with an array of things that looked like kitchen utensils that were all hung on the frame yeah. and he started bashing these things like mad at, 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 at least double the tempo of everything else and i thought i, I was giving him the thumbs up yeah fine because he looked like a pretty scary character looked like <laughs> right. someone had gone at him with a machete and he had a scar from here to here wow. i think you're not going to mess with this guy but um the people i was working with said no the idea with this is that you play it back very quietly like jungle chatter and again completely different uh a different approach uh that i was able to interest peter gabriel in funnily enough um and um i think he liked the fact that you know we had something that was high tech we had simmons drums and and then we had you know the utensils um yeah. nobody was being a straight drummer really um but it was it, it was interesting sonically very very interesting they were all serving the song in a very different kind of kind of way nothing traditional about it yeah in a career that spans over 50 years um you stayed so true to all the things that excited you about music and it's never a linear thing it's all there's always interesting exit ramps and journeys through the mount you know metaphorically speaking um yeah hopefully there's been those deviations that have been worth it yeah i uh i read your book recently and i was struck by the i i had remembered this from a while back but i wrote it down because i thought it was worth uh thinking about Guitarist, writer seeks, receptive musicians determined to strive beyond, yeah, determined to strive beyond existing stagnant musical forms. Yeah. Buddy, in their early 20s, you probably yeah. would have been right around 20 when you wrote that. That's a, that's a pretty yeah. manifesto. Yeah, it, it, it was, um, I think that it was aspirational. Um, as, as a friend of mine said to me once, um, many years ago he said it's on the day that you decide to become a master chef that you become a master chef um even if you haven't even cut a carrot in half right and i think that there's everything in intention yes um and then of course yeah they, 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 then you, you you spend a lifetime trying to make that that dream a reality but 
um, that was something I, I set for myself then. Yeah. And um, of course, over time, you you realize that there's perhaps nothing that is truly original. You can merely juxtaposition uh, various ideas. You can take a pan genre approach. You can do all of that. But what I look for more in, 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 in music, whether it's from myself or someone else, uh, is um, authenticity. So I'm I'm after music that's really felt and 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 changes that were really, really really good. Um, I, I can't stress this enough. I'm, I, I'm th th there's so many times where I think, well, yes, I'm going to work within a within a genre. Do I want to be merely typ typical in this genre and to be totally authentic and really feel it? Say a blues song or Am I going to um, stir things up and add something to it that that um, I won't necessarily come up with when I've got a guitar in front of me because I'll be being the guitarist, but to wear another hat, um, I think I think sometimes the best ideas the most radical ideas will come along when you, you don't have an instrument in front of you you can't fall back on technique that trajectory and what's known and and you, you may be very good at certain things and um, um it's it's easy to do things that would have seemed stunning to the young player but if you try to do something for the medium that was the equivalent of what bach had done for for harmony and dexterity and and uh, and all the rest, um, yeah, that that's a pretty pretty tall order, I think. You know, yeah. has only one ever been quite as good at it all as as Bach? And it was Bach who came up with tapping. I was trying to channel Bach one day when I did something with electric guitar that, that ended up inspiring a young Eddie Van Halen, um, amongst others. So um, it's merely one technique. What are you going to do with it? That's, that's the thing. So I'm pretty hard on myself, I have to say, and I'm, I'm terribly changeable. Um, and I'm not really that interested, to be honest, in, in commercial success. I don't think I want to play the game to that degree. You know, or, or I, I see videos and I see bands and I see the whole sort of rock thing going on and, uh, and I realize I'm, I'm, I'm looking at a museum of moves. There it is again, you know, it's the, uh, yeah. the legs apart, it's the posturing, it's the big hair, it's all of this, all that stuff. And you think, yeah, you know, it's so easy to go for that whole macho, God's gift to women thing, but, um, What's the difference when you're listening to to music that survived for centuries? We think well, we don't really know. You know what I mean? I don't think there was any crowd surfing going on <laughs> in, in Baroque times, as far as we know. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The uh, your shows have uh, all of the elements that you would that you wouldn't be out of line comparing to a great. Uh, symphonic experience i mean it rides it there's a lot of uh emotional currents and undertow and it's a very powerful thing because uh again it's it's 50 years of your i love the fact that you're representing the new material yeah and you're representing some of your older material which yep. seems to me could have easily been powerful genesis tracks the stuff off uh Voyage of the Acolyte and things like that. Uh, yeah. A, a modern reinterpretation of uh, the Genesis classics, which are just, it's a, an amazing thing what you're doing to be able to traverse all of those. And it's, it, it's all, there's a through line to everything. 
it makes perfect sense when you hear everything together, whether it's. Yeah, I, I, I think I've, I've um, in recent years, and I mean, I've had a lot of time to think about, you know, what the appeal was of, of Genesis and what I like best about it. And um, um, there seems to be a golden period for me, which happens around about 1972 to 73, where two albums back to back, Foxtrot and Selling England by the Pound were, um, when I listened back to them, I think in terms of writing, um, there's not really a weak track on either of those albums. Now, I realize that all music, uh, the appreciation of it uh, or the rejection of it is, is merely subjective, but um, it seems to me that that's a golden period. It's when I hear Tony functioning at his most surprising harmonically and 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 tonally and and um, and doing a lot more with with less. I think as more equipment came later on, perhaps um, you know that the very limitation of having a mere Mellotron Mark II, which I thought hard to get, um, uh, and perhaps an RMI piano, which happened later, but I think, and a monophonic synthesizer, blah, 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 an art pro soloist, old kit. You don't need to have necessarily these things in order to be able to, you know, serve old Genesis material. I think um, there are many ways to skin a cat. And I hope we never have to do that. But I think it's uh, somehow, somehow uh, I, I I don't look for for the the old means to to to, to conjure up. You know, <laughs> let's put it another way: the old rabbits will still come out of the hat, but with with new gear or, or new places to stuff these things up the sleeves and what have you. Um, so I, you know, I would. I would go for more modern gear that perhaps does it yeah. does it better or differently. Maybe one should never say never say better because you know the fuzz box was a great was a great invention and the right fuzz box with the right effect on it can still sound wonderful. It can still still tear through. But then I I would use a line six in the main. You know, a yellow line six. Yeah. I used a very a, a very kind of early Yardbirds sound on one of the uh, tracks of the album. I realized I was channeling the recently departed um, late, great, late great Jeff Beck. And, um, um, you know, the, the early workouts with uh, with the use of reverb or repeat echo and, and Fuzzbox um, sounded wonderful. You know, if you had that tearing sound, but then you had it tunneling through um, a long reverb, um, that was a sound that used to spook me and send me, and um, and it still does. So occasionally, I'll do that, and then well, that's not an upfront front sound, but um, I might go for something that's that's closer, but contrast it. So I'm happy to be someone else. You know, back way back then when I thought, oh, it sounds like a like a kind of spooky violin, or there's there's some other instrument here that's coming out of this. And um, uh, tone, I think, is is pretty much everything, really. You know, I think that when you're plugging in your guitar, and you must know this yourself, when you think yourself, oh, well, this is a great sound. You think I can go anywhere with this. This great sound would take me anywhere. This is the vehicle. The vehicle is is the sound. Um, I can pilot it or I can drive it, uh, but you have to have that that great um, great sound that, that, that transcends the, the limits of your own personal imagination, it seems to me. Yeah. When you came uh, into the picture at nursery crime and then through the all the way through and to wind and weathering yes it seemed like a, a it, on one hand maybe a little difficult but on the other hand very fortuitous 
for your compositional skills to be, it seems like there was small groups, you would have Tony and Mike working together on something, and maybe you and Pete would work on something, but it seemed like you were kind of like George Harrison in a way. Yeah, were, I think so. You were stockpiling amazing. I would be fascinated to find out what the band would have thought when the first solo album came out, because yeah. they had to hear yeah. some of the kernels of what came to be those legendary songs, but not unlike uh, All Things Must Pass. You know, yeah. what you were able to release and what George yes. It was yeah. an amazing, fertile. Well, I think it must have been very difficult for George Harrison working with um, the, the two giants of, of Lennon McCartney um, and also under the auspices of George Martin, um, Jeff Emmerich and the various engineers that, that um, you know, formed the brilliant team. Um, but I was aware that, that at, at some point it seemed as if um, I'd shifted my allegiances beyond the stellar work of, of McCartney and Lennon, Lennon McCartney, and was aware that it seemed that from the White Album onwards, the guy who really had the goods was, was George Harrison. No mean feat. You know, very difficult very difficult thing to do but I suspect there was this idea that as was the case with me with Genesis that um, you know, I, I, I was serving the interests mainly of the founder members and if I wanted to do a tune I had to ask permission uh, whereas there was an assumption from the, um, the old guard so to speak that their ideas would uh, be carried out uh, founder members hold sway, of course. Um, this will be true with any any band. It just so happened we had some brilliant guys, and um, it seems that each of the um, the members of the band were capable of coming up with quite something on, on their own, um, as history shows. Uh, also, I think my predecessor, um, Anthony Phillips, um, it's easy to forget that actually he was the main writer yeah. um, on the stuff that had, had proceeded and was a, a very capable keyboard player too. Um, uh, I, I've worked with him a few times and I've gotten to know him personally and he's a, he's a good friend. And I, and I, I often said to him, well, actually, you know, if we'd have been in the band at the same time, I don't think there would have been any any problem. I mean, he had a much more um, democratic, philanthropic idea of um, you know the whole team moving forward simultaneously, all ideas on the table, everything welcome, and that's the basis on on which I joined the band. Peter Gabriel said to me, "We're a songwriters collective." Once you join us, you're a full writer. You write a guitar part. Blah, 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 blah. Um, so you know that was that that was appealing, um, and I found I could shape things um, by working on top of other people's um, uh, chord sequences at times, or coming up with the chord sequence myself. Um, but obviously, you know that team was very very competitive, and I think. Separate agendas um, are what not necessarily brought it to its knees because it managed to survive for many decades in one form or another. But um, you know, it's it's a band that started to lose lose people, um, as in Anthony Phillips, as in Peter Gabriel, as in as in myself. And um, I don't think that was any impediment to um, commercial success. But I think that the period that I, I've, I've noted that I think is the golden period is here's, here's something where everyone's contributing equally. Yeah. Foxtrot selling in by the pound and, um, 
And it's really good when someone else runs with the ball or you hand the baton on to someone else or I'll show something and say, well, we could do this. Thinking, please use my idea, but I'm so used to, you know, being shouted down that um, there's there's no point. Um, so that's why, yes, there was a, a stockpiling of, of ideas and it came to a head really with Lamb Lies Down on Broadway where we knew we were going to lose Pete. Um, and you, you can hear the competitive struggle between um, overly populated keyboard parts overlaid with overly populated lyrical parts yeah. and it's what creates the kind of claustrophobic but cohesive nature of that that album meanwhile i thought well perhaps i'll return to an earlier model here and um, and go for my own, own kind of radical thing but um but i can agree things very quickly because i've only got a grip with myself at breakfast and myself at tea time um there are no, no internal politics going on just hoping that i would come up with it enough ideas right. and um, sometimes it's easier to be honest to come up with a whole mass of ideas than just try and get one idea through that you think is is your strongest yeah the um, it seems like there's many bands that went through what you went through right around that same period of time where you've got some great commercial success you guys with uh, Foxtrot and Selling England by the Pound Pink Floyd with uh, dark side of the moon and metal prior to that but then you get yeah you get to a point where it's uh great success but people are able to see where their differences lie and they're starting to move mm -hmm. because we're every human being every musician every band member is on their their own journey and they're evolving in yes. different trajectories but yeah. uh, it seems like the lamb lies down on broadway would be a very difficult time because you know, Peter's about to have a child. You're moving into a yes. place to record, and Headley Grange was not the the nicest place in the world to. No. Nope. Yeah, and it was difficult. You know, Phil had just become. Well, he'd inherited a family in a way, um, um, and uh, it wasn't safe for his wife and, and Kitty to be there. Um, uh, yeah, Pete was going through, or his wife was going through difficulty with their pregnancy. I just um, I separated from my wife, and um, so the band was, was was growing up. There were children involved. Um, suddenly, um, it's very different from the um, you know four or five musketeers all for one. No, actually, you know our tribes are getting bigger, and so. Uh, you can't. You've got to. You, you've got to try and steer some some middle path, and a lot of compromises um, to be made. Um, I think that. Um, I think it's very easy to say after the event. Oh, we should have taken more time off and let Pete do this, that, and the other. But I I suspect that the agenda was was maybe. Um, broader than that you know um it's it's a real shame i mean to have a singer of the caliber of, of peter gabriel um uh to just let it go i don't know about that not to mention whatever i felt i brought to the band and and phil as well um where at one point they say goodbye to phil as well um but um you can look at it this way. I remember Peter Gabriel saying to me in the early days, and this was after there'd been some internal politics that he was finding it very hard to, to swallow. Um, he said, well, no one's irreplaceable, including me, he said, referring to himself. And um, even when a band does, you know, wonderful work of, of the quality of a, of a Genesis or, or, or even the Beatles, there's still going to be um, this kind of internal dynamic where everybody is the same age as they were when they first started out in the band. 
and uh, and in Janice's case, um, they first started working together in some shape or form ever since they were eleven years old. So there were many many issues that went back back a long way. But the English educational system that they went through, the private school that they went through, was um, designing them all to become um, yeah. huge successes in their own right. Uh, it's the kind of educational system, charter houses like Eton or Harrow, where they're designing prime ministers or the future viceroy of India. It's it's not really, it's not designed to produce um, uh, rock and rollers who are philanthropic and, and um, yeah. <laughs> right. all the rest. No, yeah, it, the idea is you bluster through, you, it's, it's almost like jousting. You've got to unseat the other guy. He's on his horse. Your lance goes through his helmet and then he is no more and you you carry on. And um, I think there was so much of this, <laughs> this, this thing um, going on, but quietly that the fans weren't really aware of. And, and, and why should they? Why should they say, oh, okay, somebody getting through. I think that's Brian. We've got a meeting with him in a minute, I think. Um, so, um, yeah, you know, I mean, it was a brilliant team. Um, John Lennon said at, at one point in the early 70s, he thought that, that Genesis were true sons of the Beatles. Yeah. And um, that's something that I, I absolutely cherish, the fact that he thought he thought we were good enough. That's, that's good, because um, most of the English musicians I know are riddled with doubt. Um, yours truly included. We, we don't do that. I think at school we don't get taught to be confident. We might get taught to be competitive, but we're not taught to be confident. Uh, you know, you're nothing special. Who the hell do you think you are, etc. So it's the equivalent of hazing that starts when you're right. you know, this big and goes on for a very long time. And at the end of the day, despite all this disapproval, etc., etc., you actually good get good at, at something. Um, so you know, in in the face of all this this opposition, uh, it's 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 a strange it's a strange thing that the Brits have got. Uh, I don't know why it was like that, um, but um, it, it's produced all sorts of extraordinary things. It, it it's produced the Beatles. It's produced it's produced a. a a Prabhahara, it has produced a Genesis, a Yes, a King Crimson, a Jethro Tull, not to mention part Crosby Stills, all, all of that, you know, informing the Californian scene. And uh, yeah, McLaughlin, of course, you know, Mahavishnu, his work with, with, um, uh, with Miles Davis, um, radical stuff. Um, America, of course, produced Gershwin, Paul Butterfield, yeah. uh, Mike Bloomfield, uh, Elvin Bishop, um, all of whom I consider to be geniuses yeah. in their own right. And um, uh, I, I have a, an extraordinary uh, memory of, of seeing that blues-based band but then they would go into East West at the end, Mike Bloomfield's idea, where it's right off the scale and it's going to be different every night. Um, a, a band that was absolutely on fire from the word go. Um, unfortunately, playing to a handful of people. Um, but uh, the power of it wasn't lost on me. Um, it was one of the most powerful experiences I'd ever ever had because um, part of what I do is I am a kind of frustrated Paul Butterfield wannabe that's me <laughs> like harp that is yeah yeah. I, yeah blues harp that's it that's it it's a brilliant sounding instrument um if you get it right no one had a, a more brilliant sound than than Butterfield um uh to do that with just a few notes tiny instrument but 
almost limitless tonal range uh, is is something a testament to his true genius. Every now and again, I had I had Paul Butterfield dreams, and, and the other night I had one, and I was saying to him, um, "You don't realize what a, a genius you are." And uh, he was content to listen to me. He praised upon him in my in my dream, Amen. and um, yeah. Uh, I I really feel that in my my heart of hearts that there's that there's there's that yeah we need more bands like that yeah there there was a very exciting uh, I mean over here we they we spawned that but we had players like yourself and uh, Peter Green and yes Mick Taylor I I saw yes who, who was that Mick Taylor did you say I mean just some of the exciting blues players from that. Yeah, I mean, I saw many gigs with Peter Green when he was with uh, John Mayle shortly after Eric Clapton left. And uh, I got to see these guys when they were very young. And um, Peter Green was stunningly good. Um, there are a couple of cuts that I'd recommend if anyone wants to know how powerful he was with, with John Mayle. Um, there's Looking Back, and so many roads. So many roads, yeah. Sure. Yeah, but the guitar work on both those tracks is, whoa, watch out. You know, this is uh, incredible stuff. So I, I often saw him and you knew it was going to be good. Um, oh my God, one night I, I arrived a little bit late. I can't remember because I was walking up with friends. And as I walked into this small venue, there he was playing with John Mayle and, and they were doing the stumble and they were doing the difficult bit. The double stop yeah, moments. Thing, yeah. And he was smiling at um at uh, uh the band master, of course, you know. He was smiling at his boss as if he was doing that, and the sound was just brilliant. Yeah. It was so good, it looked so effortless. You know, people say this to me, I say, oh, it looks so effortless what you're doing. There might be something else going on in the player's mind. We'll never know right. how effortless or effortful <laughs> it all is. But <laughs> right. I'm glad you mentioned Peter Green because um, very often an unsung genius that that was the first thing to lunch, you know, like the touch uh, paper with Fleetwood Mac um, that have been very interesting in all their incarnations of course um yeah stellar work and and what a what an arc that that band went oh yeah and, 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 and danny Kerwin too that yeah. little wonderful track um jigsaw puzzle blues which is which is his again um um it was the flip side of albatross and i remember thinking yeah, Albatross is okay, but it's a little bit low energy. But listen to this one on on the uh, on the flip side. And um, uh, Danny at that time said um, it was influenced by. I'm thinking of um, Stefan Grappelli and the Hot Club too. Oh yeah. Of, uh, of um, I'm forgetting the guitarist name. Isn't that awful? This is what Thank happened. You, in Seventy-four. Sorry. Thank you, Reinhardt. Django, that's right, Django Reinhardt, and like like an electric Django Reinhardt, and I thought, oh, this is wonderful. This is a kind of evolved trad jazz taken to electric guitars, um, not a note wrong, wonderful tone, um, almost kind of clarinet tone, French clarinet tone yeah. vibrato, um, masterfully done, little little masterpiece but none, nonetheless you know a perfect miniature and one that haunts it won't go away very interesting tone with that out of phase pickup thing that he had in his les paul that kind of you think that was the out of phase um thing? i mean very, I, there was very, something very about, upper harmonic. yeah yeah inherent in that tone that was very yes. unique and very yes uh, exciting very very good I, I i i agree with you that you know i've often wondered because there's not that much distortion there i don't i don't think but um 
but it seems to sit right at the front of the speakers and um, you know the go-to is to have distortion but sometimes as in um, uh, Paul Butterfield's harmonica playing you know the upper harmonic being yeah prevalent and um, there's distortion but not necessarily masses of it you've got that kind of um, uh, thing again that just is the most exciting sound on earth um, what's more exciting guitar or harmonica I don't know the jury the jury's out yeah there, there's some incredibly exciting players uh, on one end of the spectrum John Popper from Blues Traveler I mean right kind of Charlie Parker of harmonica and then you know all right of course Paul Butterfield and uh, Kim Wilson of the uh, fabulous Thunderbirds. Right. Texas uh, harp player. Right. Yeah. And the, well, that, you know, that distorted harp thing um, where it becomes another instrument again, and many times people mistake it for guitar and say, oh, I just assumed that was guitar. But, um, never mind. Guitars can do something similar, of course. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Let's not forget slide with guitar as well. Give you that wide vibrato. Yeah. You know, give you that wonderful, um, that wonderful thing. Yeah, my wife and I have seen you twice recently, and the most just saw you a couple months ago uh, at the Carolina Theater. We live here in Raleigh, North Carolina, and uh, right, we were doing some things with. And I'm glad that you told me that that was a ring because I kept watching. I had I was. The, you know, those little box seats that are on the side there. Yeah. The seats. I was looking down, seeing you do that. I was like, it doesn't have a slide. That has to be a ring. I just don't know where he's got that. But it, it yes. is a wonderful effect or sound well, or color, I should say. It's, yeah, it, it is a color. Um, it's um, a way of, um, well, it's a way of bending notes in, in, in one way. Um, you can slide right down the, the strings and it will be easy to assume that I was using the edge of the plectrum to do that, but um, it's quicker than that. Yeah. Um, um, and if you do it at a certain speed, it'll sound like you're doing it with a whammy bar. Yeah. Um, but um, it's slightly different again, you know, it's, it's, it's that, that thing. I remember my brother, funnily enough, I, we both had rings. And when he was practicing rock guitar many years ago, and he was going through the same equipment in the bedroom, we had this little, tiny little setup going through a radio. And he was doing the same thing that I'd, I'd done. He went, whoa, whoa, and I thought, oh, that sounds great. Yeah, that's, um, there's something about that sound. It's very, very exciting. Yeah. It's very kind of, it's clever. It's exciting. What? What the hell is it? You know, it's right. at a distance. Uh, the same thing we, you were you, you were saying. So it's it's another kind of slide. Um, um, yeah, um, there's so much you can do with it if you're if you're clever. Yeah. I think. I um, like I like the use of the Digitech whammy pedal on the the, the first track, uh, "People of the Smoke." There's that yes, whammy pedal. That really cool. A descending kind of atonal thing i'm not i haven't sat down and transcribed that yet but right. it's on my yeah. list of things to do to sit down and yes. learn that it's a brilliant right thing. oh I, i'm glad you like that yeah i think i might have used the digitech to, to conjure an extra octave down so that i got that um i think um as far as i know on that track i didn't use use it going upwards but then other tracks i did you know sometimes uh, I've got an extra octave being conjured on um, upwards on um, taking you down, for instance. That's got a fair amount of, of digitech in it. Yeah. Um, again, it, it's tone, isn't it? You know, working an octave outside its range, the guitar can be very, very interesting. I've got a, I've got a pog that does that. Um, and um uh, but for the upper thing i normally try and back up all the top and um uh use use an octave above because it it does it can get very screamy yeah um but 
it's it's one of those tricks it's one of those one of those things it becomes ultra responsive uh when it's when it's doing that so i mix it with various things these days sometimes i'll introduce a wah wah pedal into into it as well in order to make it even more mellow and um um but you know live experimenting you never really know what's going to come off so it can be a little bit shrill um but there'll be other times when you hit it and you think well <laughs> it's it's surprising even me you know that's that's the thing i didn't expect it to be this good and i'm i'm going off on one oh yeah i live for those moments of i'm just there almost like a bystander and someone's picked up my hands and is is doing it it's yeah and it, it is doing something stunning you know maybe once every 20 gigs or so that that might happen if i'm lucky but <laughs> those are the glimpses of nirvana that 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 we we live for well it's a brilliant way to kick off the new album um i love the pastiche at the beginning with the uh the radio announcer and the you know the sirens and I, I i get it it alludes to uh I, i'm guessing um post world war ii you know people of the smoke yeah. being yes being raised London, 1950 yeah yeah uh, sullivan house overlooking battersea power station yes thing. absolutely all, all of that yeah all of that is, is part of it and uh, it is actual radio from yeah uh from 1950 the year i was born um so it frames the album in a way the, the bbc samples of that yeah. the very patronizing sound of, of auntie bbc as we call her uh, thank you so much steve all the best Real okay pleasure. thank you thanks john all the best mate See okay you bye 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 thank you for tuning in to the guitar hang podcast interviews with noteworthy guitar players from around the world go ahead and hit the subscribe button and ring the bell for notifications to stay updated on our latest episodes.